Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third RSS COVID evidence session. Today, session focuses on evidence and policy making. I am Daniela De Angelis. I am the chair of today's event, and I am assisted by the other organizers, uh, Sylvia Richardson and John Aston. They will be uh, keeping an eye on the online chat as we as we progress, proceed. Okay, as you might know, uh, the, uh, there is a UK COVID-19 inquiry uh, starting soon. Uh, this has been set up to ex examine the UK preparedness and response to the COVID pandemic and to learn lessons for the future. And in this context, the RSS has been organizing a series of events to start discussion, in around the issues concerning statistics and data that arose during the pandemic with the aim of identifying areas of consensus and, and questions that might require more investigation and, and perhaps eventually to inform the RSS contribution to the inquiry. So in this, uh, four areas, four key areas have been identified. Uh, that they might need a, a little bit more uh, investigation. First, the way the government communicated during the pandemic. Second, the statistical resources available during the pandemic. Third, how evidence and decision making, uh, evidence informed policy, and the evaluation of intervention and policy. So today's focus is on how evidence informed policy making. A statistician, our job is to ex extract evidence from data. So the focus of today's session is very much at the heart of our vocation. So we will be exploring five key questions. These are related to the value of statistical thinking in an emergency, the use of and communication statistical models during a pandemic, the how the statisticians or the role of statisticians in an emergency and how they should train for this task, uh, how statisticians can contribute to policy making and be trusted, and then how data from elsewhere um, uh, outside the UK has been feeding into the UK evidence for decision. So uh, we have uh, four distinguished uh, scientists who are going to join us to discuss and to address these questions. Uh, they've been all uh, in some different ways involved in the pandemic response. Uh, we'll be having Sarah Wonka, Professor of Medical Statistics and Epidemiology uh, in Oxford. Uh, Sebastian Fang, Professor of Infection Disease Dynamic at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I'm Arurg, Director of the Health Analysis and Pandemic Insight at the UNS. And Professor Nick Ju, Chair of Biostatistics and Epidemiology at the London School and Professor of Biostatistics and Statistics at the School of Public Health at the University of California in Berkeley. Now, um, the running order of, of, of this session is, is as follows. Uh, this is my introduction, which hopefully will have taken less than five minutes. There will be the presentation from our speakers, will take 10 minutes each um, for a total of roughly 45 minutes. Then there's going to be a panel discussion where the panel will be uh, the uh, speakers as well as the organizers, uh, which will last roughly 20 minutes. That will be a serious, and in this case, I think 11 of two minute contributions, and they'll take roughly 25 minutes. That is going to be a, a Q&A &A session from the audience and from whoever might have put uh, comments on the chat, um, and, and there'll be closing remarks. Please do feel free and in fact I would encourage very much you to um, contribute with your comments and questions in, in the chat because we are planning to 
uh, right up the, the, the questions, the discussion of this session and, um, and also the contribution of, on, on the chat will, will be accounted for in the writing up as well as in the discussion at the end. So, and then I will conclude with some uh, uh, remarks at the end, roughly five minutes. So this is a total of a couple of hours. So we've got an awful lot to go through. So I would, uh, I would just uh, start the session and we'll, we'll start with um, Sarah Walker, who is the Chief Investigation and Academic Lead for the ONS COVID-19 Infection Survey. Uh, to you, Sarah. Okay, let me just find my presentation. Thank you, Daniela. Right, can everyone see, can someone say if they can see that? Yes. Brilliant. Okay, so um, just to be really clear, this is a personal perspective and I will um, perhaps deliberately try to, to be slightly provocative. Um, I'm going to focus on, on three of the five questions that, that Danny raised, uh, particularly the value of thinking, thinking about how statisticians prepare and train and about uh, being a trusted intermediary. So, I mean, I think I've been asked to go first because I kind of made my first slide, if you like, the very basics. National emergencies rely on information. Information requires data analysis and or new studies. And you can't really do either optimally without statistical thinking because it's the statistical question that's being addressed that should determine the design of each analysis or study and because avoiding bias is critical. And uh, one of my favourite quotes, you can't fix by analysis what you've bungled by design. But it isn't actually just about design. Um, and again, another one of my favourite quotes from Deming, you know, a long time ago said, a statistician's responsibility is not confined to plans. They must also seek assurance of cooperation in the field and office and maintain constant touch with the work, also with the interpretation. And I have a couple of quotes which I use a lot, uh, obviously um, taken from, from a famous war, war quote. It's, it's even not even just the design, but it's really this interdependence between statistics, statistical analysis, operations, what goes on in the field, and then the underlying medicine and biology. And frankly, if you lose any of the three, you end up in a disaster. So while statistical thinking is essential, it's got to be statistical thinking linked to these other two critical aspects, not statistical thinking on its own. I was asked to give some examples of getting it wrong and I would really, you know, uh, highlight the Papati study, which I have a lot of challenges with. This is a study that did two antibody tests in a lot of people with positive PCR test results in the national programme. The first antibody test taken within six days of getting a positive test result and the second three weeks later. In the information sheet, they stated explicitly that doing an antibody test after a PCR result helps the NHS learn how likely people are to get COVID again and how the body's immune system responds to the virus or vaccine. And I think this demonstrates a really critical failure to understand or perhaps acknowledge that six days after you get a result back is almost always already too late given that people generally have symptoms before they test positive. And, you know, real failure to understand that testing PCR positives doesn't tell you about risk. I've lost track of the number of meetings I've been in where these results have been presented as showing no correlates of protection. This is like looking at dead people and thinking that that tells you about the risk of dying. Uh, you can always do something uh, with a bad experiment, however. Um, I, I think in terms of, you know, where statistical thinking maybe hasn't hasn't helped us so much, it is this concept of what is good enough. Um, and again, you know, not letting the best be the enemy of the good. And as statisticians, you know, this avoidance of bias is extremely important important to us. But I think the pandemic's really made me question what level of evidence is sufficient 
or at least how much bias is acceptable in terms of tr- decision making, particularly when you're trading it off against other aspects. And, you know, in a pandemic, the key aspect is timeliness. And I think, you know, the test negative case control designs for vaccine effectiveness are really pertinent here. Um, these compare vaccination status in symptomatic people presenting for testing and testing positive versus testing negative. The substantial and important concerns about testing behaviour, adjusting for confounders relating to health status leading to bias. Very elegant paper, um, including one of the speakers this evening, but it, it is elegant without that. Um, but, but, you know, nevertheless, you know, one has to ask the question, you know, if this is a little bit biased, you know, how much impact does that really have on decision making? How much does a little bit of bias change what we would infer from this in terms of policy and what we need to do? And I think increasingly I'm trying to think about what is a good enough analysis, plus some kind of awareness or quantification of plausible bias, although, of course, directionality is tricky. For example, you know, through theoretical studies like this may actually be something that the profession could really offer. Of course, the challenge is deciding what is and isn't good enough, and that requires both balance and judgment, which feeds into the training aspect. I think another, you know, good example of, you know, trying to think about what is and isn't good enough is is about incidence estimates. I mean, I would argue that the testing data has been good enough uh, in many, many ways, particularly for trends, even though we know it's substantially biased by testing behaviour. The estimates we produce from CIS, you know, we can't make them timely because we're using prevalence to estimate incidents and there is an inherent delay. And of course, the ZOE estimates, you know, fundamentally use the incidence of new symptoms plus positivity estimates and a large number of other underlying assumptions calibrated to other sources. Where is the balance here between, you know, bias and good enough? And then I think, you know, there's another issue around the precautionary principle. If you think about all the work around face masks at the beginning, you know, how much evidence is actually needed in terms of deciding what is good enough and, uh, you know, potentially just a precautionary approach. OK, a brief words about preparation and training. I think two things um, really uh, stand out strongly for me. The first is breadth of experience. When you've got an unknown unknown, you just need to have seen a lot of stuff. And I think there's also a big piece about valuing diversity in statistical approaches. Different doesn't necessarily mean wrong. I think that's diversity in design. You know, and I would, you know, really highlight the survey and react here. Very different designs, household individuals, selection from address lists or GP lists, longitudinal repeated cross sectional uh, with a lot of work on, you know, using these piece lines, piece lines to join the dots. Different approaches, delivery, different approaches to waiting. Both have strengths and I think diversity can be a strength. But also diversity in analysis, um, you know, deciding what models best correspond to the real world situation to which methods must be applied. Again, an old quote, but, you know, nothing really changes. And again, I think the vaccine effectiveness analysis here is a really good example of diversity in analysis approaches. So not just the test negative case control, but different approaches using Poisson regression, Cox proportional hazards, target trial approaches. And they have got different trade offs and they make different assumptions uh, and have, you know, different potential biases. So. There is also a big piece about just not forgetting the basics, confounding interaction, you know, the the analysis comparing Omicron and Delta hospitalisations showed the critical importance of adjusting for age very finely, given background shifts in RSV and respiratory infections, as well as the calendar date, deprivation, local area effects, etc. You know, remembering that without primary care data linkage, you don't have good information on prior health conditions and you can't adjust for this properly. 
you know, I've said at the start about valuing, valuing operations, how the data are collected, not the, just the data itself. And I think for linked data, this becomes even more critical. Understanding where this data is coming from, this is something that we really should be preparing statisticians to think more about. You know, for our linked data, who gets tested where? You know, what database is that test result in? Not being positive doesn't mean negative. It, it, you know, length of stay of one day or more or died on the first day because, you know, a four hour dialysis counts as an admission in our data. Issues with coding bias, hospitalizations with and from COVID. And, you know, what does reporting symptoms in a symptomatic test even mean? How can statisticians give advice and be trusted? Well, you know, I just want to, to pull back to the fact that actually everything's done by people. And if you, you know, look into social psychology, they would tell you the most important thing is that there are in groups and there are out groups. And, and fundamentally, I think that statisticians may need to recognise that data and facts aren't everything. And actually, social psychology suggests that to be trusted as an intermediary, you either have to become part of the in-group, which I think statisticians have really done a brilliant job of during the, during the pandemic, really getting involved in JBC and UKHSA, or you've got to work with people who are, in the in, who are part of the in-group. And you've also got to tell the story. Why does this matter to people? And if you again, if you read the literature, there's a very good acronym FOAM and FACTS is only 25 percent of it. And actually, if you want to give advice and be trusted, you've got to tell people what they need to hear in a way that they can understand and they can relate to. And whilst we may be FACTS people, not everyone is. The reflections, I think I said at the start, you know, timeliness really critical in an emergency. And uh, there's something wrong about everything. So focusing on what we can actually do better now, um, or at least estimate the impact of what we're not doing perfectly might be, uh, is, is really more important than criticising an inevitable lack of perfection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah, for your insights, so your um, you know personal experience of all of this, personal reflection. We can uh, we continue with Sam. Sam Fang is um, professor at the London School, as I said, and also has been a member of the SPIMO, the Scientific Pandemic Influenza Subgroup on Modeling. Please, Sam. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry, just bear with me one moment. Just to redo this. Uh, but away. Um, no. Sorry. Right. Uh, there we go. That one. That's what I wanted. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Danny, for the invitation, and uh, thanks, Sarah, for the really nice introduction. I will also. Um, give a personal perspective, but I say introduction to you, Sarah, because I will touch upon many of the points that you have raised. I will specifically talk about this um, from the perspective of uh, as a modeler and a member of SPIAM, as Danny mentioned, but I will speak about this in a personal capacity and not in any way representing SPIAM. And the, the, what I'll do is, uh, there's two things I, I would like to do. First, I'll give a few examples, in fact, five examples of where I think statistical modeling has played a key role during the uh, pandemic uh, by virtue of examples of work that has come through SPIAM. And then uh, I will expand a bit broader on uh, what I think the value is of statistical thinking in, an, in a pandemic and try to give a bit of an outlook into the future. Okay, on to my five examples. Uh, first of all is, uh, I don't think I need to explain to anyone anymore at this stage what a reproduction number is. Um, has played a role in many key analysis, but also for real-time situational awareness. And the most common model used for estimating reproduction numbers globally, really, is this renewal equation model where you have the number of infections, and uh, which is uh, the sum over the distribution of generation intervals, so the time uh, from infection until infecting others, um, multiplied with 
infections at a previous time, and then you sum over all these possible previous times, and it's multiplied with a scale factor, which is a reproduction number. And of course, this is a fairly sort of common statistical model. It's just an autoregressive time series model where the scaling factors over time are given, and then there's a, a common scaling factor at each time point that is being estimated. Um, there's a slight extra complication in the case of COVID, or maybe in many other cases as well, which is that we don't observe infections directly, so they're, uh, they're being convolved with an incubation period to a number of symptomatic cases, and then perhaps there's a reporting distribution. So there's a little bit of statistical work to be done, but all of this can be done using fairly standard statistical tools. And here's one example where this was implemented in the pro probabilistic programming language, STAN, to estimate from a trajectory of cases here in bars, a time series of infections, as well as a corresponding reproduction number over time. And this was one of the several models that fed into the um, official, as it were, t uh, estimate of the UK government um, for reproduction numbers. Okay, so second example um, relating to the use of, uh, let's, let's make change, here we go, slide. Um, use of reproduction numbers was the transmissibility of new variants. So this is work done on the alpha variant that emerged in the winter 2020, uh, leading to a study uh, led by Nick Davis et al. This was one of the methods going into this. And here, looking at local reproduction numbers over time, so each dot representing a local area, and then we go through this week by week, it's a bit like a film strip. And what we could see is that as the proportion in each local area with uh, um, the alpha variant increased, so moving here to the right, we saw an increase of the reproduction number and could use that to estimate the advantage in terms of reproduction numbers of alpha over the previously circulating wild type, done in this case with a um, general additive model um, leveraging these reproduction number estimates. Um, new variants don't just generally come with different uh, transmissibility, they also sometimes cause differently uh, different severity of outcomes. And so here's one piece of work where this was done for Omicron compared to Delta. Um, and this was where the evidence, one of the pieces of evidence uh, showing that the hazard ratio of hospital, hospital admission from Omicron was quite a lot lower compared to Delta when adjusting for confounders, um, which is why ultimately the Omicron wave had much of a lower income uh, impact in terms of the um, burden of morbidity and hospital um, uh, occupancy than could have perhaps be feared. And this work, just like the, the other ones I showed before, all of course, did involve multiple statisticians. And in this case, again, fairly standard uh, statistical method, uh, Cox proportional has its regression. Um, another example, uh, again, quite a common one, is now casting. And this, these were the now casts of deaths like, led by um, UK Health, Health Security Agency and the MRC Centre in Cambridge. Uh, a really common problem in epidemiology that we observe quantities with a delay. So here, this is these are observations as of the 29th of June of deaths by date of death here as the black dashed line. And because um, th these deaths are recorded with a delay, um, they always kind of fall off towards the present. And uh, if these uh, delays are understood or known from previous iterations of the data, this can be corrected for to produce a so-called now cast here, shown as the black line with uncertainty. And then this is case, there's a purple line here showing um, at a later point in time what the retrospective truth looked like, so we can compare this to um, what really happened. And the, I think I've got one more example, yeah, because all of these are kind of almost statistical tasks in their nature, and a lot of the focus of the work, uh, at least the public focus of the work that came out of SPAM was on the scenario models, but also the, the scenario models themselves um, were calibrated to the existing data using statistical techniques, especially Markov chain Monte Carlo. And um, this is just one of the examples where this was done and kind of showing the fits to the data of a model which was then used to out of sample to project forward using different uh, scenarios to understand their potential impact. And that brings me to the broader 
question of the value of statistical thinking that I think transcends all of this. And, and the three key areas here really are, and the first point is what Sarah already mentioned, is, the, is respect for the data and, and an understanding of its origins and especially its limitations and uh, or, or, or the data generating process. Um, secondly, transparency of methodology so that um, observed trends and observed results can be explained clearly and investigated. And lastly, also a statistical interpretation of results um, via credible intervals um, or effect sizes, and especially the, the correlating or the, the um, corresponding uncertainty. And so that brings me to what I think, uh, one more aspect that isn't mentioned here and which I think may be an important avenue for, for the future and the involvement of statisticians. And I've already said that many of the statistical tasks in an outbreak are quite common. And so this is one example here from the um, UK HSA's technical report on the current ongoing monkeypox outbreak from a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, showing monkeypox cases by day of symptom onset. So it's, it's a bit like I showed earlier with the death data in that you can see the, the, the increase here, but then towards the present, this would always decline because of um, the delayed reporting of people whose symptom onset may have been quite recently. And so I mentioned that there are now casting methods that would allow to correct for that, given uh, observed delays up to this point, to see whether this curve is in fact declining or whether it's perhaps flattening or increasing. And I think there are two main issues with um, public, age, public health agencies around the world potentially needing to perform this task. The first one is it needs to be done quickly and uh, relating again to Sarah's point about uh, what is good enough. Generally, what tends to be good enough tends to be what is available or possible um, and doable at very sh on a very short time scale. Um, so methods need to be kind of available. And then secondly, plenty of methods on now casting have been published, but very little or much less has been published on their relative performance against each other or relative strengths and weaknesses. And there's um, just one example of a project that I'd like to mention that is trying to address this, which is the uh, German COVID-19 Nowcast Hub, which is led by Johannes Bracher, which is trying to address exactly this and in prospective evaluation, hospitalization, COVID-19 hospitalization data in Germany suffers from exactly the same problem. It's reported by symptom onset and multiple teams are every day um, submitting generated estimates and this can be used to ultimately compare it to the data as it emerged and to um, learn something about the relative performance of these methods. And I think as a general point, one thing that I have learned from this pandemic is that any method, if it is not available and implemented in uh, ready to be used software, ultimate or ideally well-documented software, and or has been subject to this kind of prospective evaluation, it's essentially useless in an urgent public health context. And I think there's a huge opportunity for statisticians to get involved right now in collaborative efforts to um, uh, understand these differences better and also make things available in the future. And that uh, brings me to conclude on a last point, which is that statistics obviously isn't everything. Even more important is the data. And ideally, uh, we'd always like to get data that's good enough that we don't even need to do statistics on it. Thank you very much. Then we all lose our jobs. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, we'll go on to Emma now. Emma Rourke is the Director of Health Analysis and Pandemic Insight at the ONS. Thank you, Emma. Uh, thank you very much uh, and good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, so I'm um, going to talk to you about um, our response to, to, the, to the pandemic. Um, and um, to start with our... Um, 
our purpose as an organisation, ONS is an independent non-ministerial government body. This is our strategy. We are immersed in what is radical, ambitious, inclusive and sustainable. Our purpose is to provide the most useful statistics for the public good. And we do that across environmental, economic and social themes. We don't road test policies, but we do develop insight that helps them understand the trade-offs um, in policy decision making. Um, so behaviours and attitudes associated with compliance, for example, um, as well as estimating prevalence uh, and, and incidence. The pandemic has changed how we do business at ONS. Um, we are a more agile organisation. We're proud of how we have helped policymakers and the public access independent trusted statistics. Um, there was a quote in The Economist um, back in, in January about civil servants bombarded statisticians with questions um, that they couldn't answer, whether people were staying at home, how consumer spending was changing, how many were wearing masks, so we need to act quickly as the National Statistical Institute. Um, we had to move. So we um, have the Aqua book, um, which is the government manual for guidance on producing quality and analysis for government. So this is in our DNA. Analysis is vital to the success of policy development and the delivery of programmes, projects and operational services. This is truly the value of statistics in what we do on a daily basis as professional government statisticians. But to go back to the question, one of the questions that, um, that have been posed for today's session, um, the previous two speakers, Sebastian and Sarah, I think have, have, have spoke really eloquently about the value of, of statistical thinking. Just to add to that, um, I think Statistics is inherently both disciplined and deeply creative. Our ability to be able to bring together um, a range of different data and apply um, our techniques to that data to provide insight and inform and enlighten um, the policy discourse um, is is absolutely integral to good policy making so that we are not constrained by our rigour and our discipline. Um, we are liberated by it and our ability to be able to be really creative with data um, and to meet some of those policy questions and those policy makers where they are with that creativity um, has been um, a, an important element of, of, of our interactions. Um, the coherence of an analytical discourse, and what I mean by that is quite often the, the way in which analysis develops is very discursive. So our ability to be able to run a piece of analysis and then discuss it freely, um, to be able to explore what that is saying, come up with a variety of hypotheses and continue to iterate. The value of doing that rapidly in the context of a national emergency, to do things that are quick and dirty, to be comfortable with what is good enough, to sort of go back to Sarah's um, words, all of that is really critical to, to the value of, of how we apply our statistical thinking and how we communicate all of that with non-analysts. Um, which, which often policymakers are non-analysts, um, supporting them to become more confident and competent in understanding statistical techniques, where the data has come from, and you know, as what's been already said, what has already been said, the point about uncertainty, presenting um, uncertainty in in words and 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 visualizing that um, to help colleagues to to engage with with the data. Where you stand determines what you see and the ability of statistical thinking to avoid myopia, the way a statistician will, th will think about the variety of different permutations and the different outcomes and what the data might be telling us um, is, is also of, of enormous value, particularly when you're looking at the intersectionality of policies. So, Analysis and evidence informs everything, every, every decision we make um, as, as, as civil servants. 
and one way that we can we can work with policymakers to support the navigation of all of those different threads is by setting out um, an analysis framework. And this is an example of, of how we've set one out um, using the COVID infection survey allowing that analytical discourse and that engagement with policy colleagues to continue to iterate the questions. What our starting question might be isn't where we end up. So that partnership through the flow of the conversation is, is, is critical. And the same comes for visualisation. So this is one element of that. You know, complex messages can be difficult to communicate and a lot of the ways in which we might visualise data um, can be really quite challenging for, for, for non-analysts. We've come some way in the analytical literacy, both across the public and in, um, in policymakers. But still, we have done a lot of work to sort of iterate the way in which we visualise our data to to ensure that we are meeting people where they are. The important thing is that the the analysis is understood because it can't be helpful if it's not understood. Um, and and to be able to bring that to the public, um, so the public are part of the wider policy discourse. Um, making sure that the whole picture is seen. We're looking at positivity and the different elements of it here in our, on our insight tool. So how should statisticians be involved as experts? Um, so as an agile partner, um, making sure that we are right there from the beginning, embedded in the policy discussions, um, um, really meaningfully, not as an add-on, somebody who's embedded um, in that decision making. ONS launched the COVID infection survey, moving from concept to first visit in just 10 days. As a National Statistical Institute, I think that's pretty agile, but it goes beyond that. It goes beyond just sort of standing something up. It's that constant movement with what is important, um, that, that being tapped into what um what is what is needed and applying our expertise at the right moment the different data um you know that, that that we are able to to draw upon is 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 critical in the context of both a multidisciplinary team but also a multi-agency one our ability to to work with academics and other government departments um, has been critical to our statisticians um, really building confidence in the understanding of, of their findings, being able to enhance the interpretation of that. And again, going back to being helpful and being useful and embedding the statistics in, um, in, a, in a way that um, decisions are truly informed. Our partnership with, with the UK Health Security Agency has been really integral to our ability to ask the right questions going back to the analytical framework. This is all driven by the questions um, that statisticians understand need to be answered. And there are a variety of other government agencies and outside of agent outside of government agencies that really um, that statisticians sort of need to feel like they're part of that orchestra. They don't always have to be the lead violinist, but they are a critical part of the overall symphony um, that is um, that is that evidence base. And embedding ourselves um, in, in that public discourse and being really approachable. So Sarah is one of our tweeting statisticians. If you if you don't already follow her, I, I suggest that you do. We do have a few of them. But by thinking about the variety of different media that we can reach out and exchange ideas with the, broad, the wider multidisciplinary community um, is really important for a statistician to avoid that myopia, to, to avoid that sort of sense that as a community, um, we often have um, all the answers at our disposal. Um, making mistakes and learning and being open to criticism um, is something that that we have um, that we have learned to do and I think that we do we do well um, and, and and colleagues like like Sarah and our tweeting statisticians really help our transparency 
and our openness to that challenge and that listening to make sure that the analysis that we're producing is the right analysis as quickly and as helpfully as possible in the context of that emergency. So practicing, you know, doesn't require a shock like a global pandemic to, to do this. Um, you know, an emergency for us has been a, a, an important catalyst, but statisticians can prepare and train the situation um, through really thinking about how to increase their agility and how to align themselves with those questions um, of the day, inserting themselves in those multidisciplinary, multi-agency conversations. Um, we need data in the infrastructure to enable preparedness. For us, contingency planning and preparedness are really crucial for effective working um, during, during the pandemic and beyond. Having a toolkit, it's not one size fits all. And some of the previous speakers talked about you know, different analytical approaches. Having a toolkit and having the confidence and the maturity and the variety of experience to bring to bear as a team on different circumstances and constantly to evaluate and reflect on the effectiveness um, of that approach. So where do we take all, all of this um, so next and prepare for the next the next shock, the next emergency for us within uh, ONS? We are um, developing the, the IDS. We're looking to bring together ready to use data to enable faster and wider collaborative analysis for the public good. This is about ONS, you know, being open for business, being a national statistical institute, that, um, that has agility and that brings in talent in all shapes and sizes um, to demonstrate to future statisticians that um, the statistical system is alive and is vibrant um, and has enormous power and influence when it comes to engaging people in what data means um, and what statistics can really do to understand the world around us. Thank you very much. The last uh, uh, of our speakers is, is Professor Nick Ju from the London School and uh, in uh, Tropical Medicine in London and the uh, University of California, Berkeley. Please, Nick. Okay, so um, I've, I've got the fortunate position of being the last of the four um, panelists to speak, so I'm sort of drawing some threads together. I should give my disclaimers that I'm probably less involved in day-to-day -day policy uh, decisions than the three other speakers in terms of my research. Um, and also I have been in uh, the United States throughout the entire pandemic. So naturally have been more engaged uh, with policy issues that reflect uh, the US uh, as compared to the UK, though I try and keep my one foot on both sides of the Atlantic. So the, the, uh, at the very beginning, Danny put up the questions and um, I'm certainly not going to address all of those questions because I'm not uh, skilled enough to do that. Um, but let me give you my quick um, overview answers. And I put answers in quotes because they're not answers, they're really thoughts. Um, I think it's clear from our experience in the pandemic, and, and this is the fifth pandemic that I've actually been involved with uh, as a statistician in my career. And I think the answer, many of these questions have been posed for all of those pandemics. And I think it's clear that for statisticians, we need more statisticians at the table um, in part because Statisticians are trained in experimentation, they're trained in uncertainty uh, communication, they're trained in evidence uh, synthesis, they're used to working in interdisciplinary teams. So not all statisticians are, are ideal for being at the table where policy decisions are made, but many are, and many have been effectively in the UK and, and elsewhere. And I, I, but I think it's clear that that should be very much part of the portfolio of a statistician uh, and their training. Um, 
Ironically, though, as a statistician, at the beginning of an outbreak or a, a crisis, rapid decisions need to be made in the absence of any data or evidence at that point, or very little evidence and data. That has led, I think, to uh, a natural tendency to rely on models, therefore, in the absence of data to guide uh, policy decisions. But I think it's uh, important that ultimately um, the role of statisticians before an outbreak, during an outbreak, um, has to be the development of effective data systems and surveillance systems. We've underinvested in surveillance systems for natural reasons that when there's nothing happening and money needs to be saved, um, cuts tend to be made for these kind of uh, data collection because people don't see the value, immediate value in them, but they're absolutely crucial. And I think we were not well served by our surveillance systems at the beginning of the pandemic. And a lot of effort has been made to improve that. Um, and I think the focus of the discussion should be not so much on what is good statistics that can handle information in outbreak, but what, what's good statistics that can best impact policy. Uh, those are somewhat different uh, goals in, in my view. And, and there's a sense in which statistics can only best impact policy when it's based on uh, accurate and informative surveillance uh, data. So in epidemiology, we're trained on the four questions when a disease occurs, particularly a novel disease, why, who, when, and where. And statistics helps provide designs for studies that can answer and address some of those questions. And for a lot of the pandemic, particularly in 2020, um, policymakers were very much flying blind because these questions were not uh, well addressed by existing uh, data systems. And going back to the modeling, um, and Seb gave some beautiful examples of how modeling can really help us understand what's going on in an outbreak, but they're not a panacea in the absence of data. And in fact, I would argue that uh, reliable population data is actually much more informative and better in translating information to the public than complex um, mathematical models. Uh, I agree that rapid response training is uh, needed. I, I, for many years of my career, was involved in preparation for earthquakes in California. An earthquake is always a, a, a danger here. There's a very high risk of an earthquake on any given day. And ultimately, over time, those events happen. And of course, it's an immediate crisis with an immediate response needed, and people need to be trained how to respond to that. And we would we would do training sessions where we would put policymakers in a room and feed them data, usually very bad data in the sense of bad outcomes, and have them learn how to make policy decisions and make trade-offs in in a, in a, a computer exercises. I, I also think that statisticians should separate themselves from ideology and try and represent data and information in a way that's ideology free and not be too uh, influenced by their own you know, idiosyncratic uh, opinions. And research and implementation are really two different uh, goals. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, there are some interesting, there's obviously going to be an awful lot um, discussed in, in the years ahead and commissions and the like about what we did well and many things were done well and what we did badly and many things were done badly. Uh, there's some interesting resources in the United States from a group called OPCAST. This is the um, actually the group of science advisors in the Obama administration who informally uh, uh, group themselves together again in the in the midst of the pandemic and have issued a whole series of reports. And there's also an interesting um, series of reports from the National Academy of uh, Sciences, Engineering and Medicine on um, things we've done well and things we've done badly. Not, of course, not limited to um, statistics. Next slide.
Okay, so here's um, going back to the data. There's, uh, uh, and we've heard some of the speakers talk both from ONS and React, which were um, great examples of the value of effective and ongoing surveillance data uh, in providing uh, information as to what's happening. And I would argue that trends in what are happening are probably more important than specific point estimates and the accuracy point estimates is a little bit coming back to what Sarah said that. Uh, trends of what are going on is probably good enough to uh, guide policy um, than very accurate uh, point estimates. There's a great need, and we, we haven't ha had much discussion today yet, and I'm certainly not an expert, but there's a great need for interoperability requirements for data to allow very rapid sharing uh, across jurisdictions. Um, I think that was particularly valuable in the UK with the sequencing data and the ability to detect new variants quickly and detect their their uh, their prevalence. Um, there's uh, a very important value in national health uh, programs. Uh, Scotland's uh, Eve two database was very useful early on with regard to in the field measurement of vaccine effectiveness. I have to say this, and I'm not speaking to an American audience, but we're very much hampered in the US, even at the state level, due to the fact that we don't have a single uh, comprehensive healthcare system. And that has really uh, made data uh, availability in the US almost non existent throughout the pandemic, still now almost uh, two and a half years into it. And, and I think there's an important role for statisticians to design what is needed in routine surveillance data and be able to rapidly implement new data collection systems in the way Emma was talking about uh, at ONS. Next slide, please. That's gone back. Sorry, can we go forward? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the role of experimentation, um, I think will be touched on in the next RSS session quite a bit, but I think that's, of course, a crucial place where statisticians are important. Their vital evidence is, has been accrued from our large scale of vaccine trials. And, and as one example, the recovery trial platform for therapies in the, in the UK. So we're all very well aware and very actually trained and we're, those uh, tr trials and uh, 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 systems were implemented very quickly because we're trained, I think, very well in that. Um, of course, as um, Sarah pointed out, randomized trials aren't the be all and end all because when we need uh, uh, we need observational studies of many issues also, in particular observational studies of vaccine effectiveness, um, comparing the effectiveness of vaccines against different variants. Um, because we can't randomize variants, we need to work with observational studies. And Sarah touched on test negative studies that were very useful in in that situation and still are quite useful. Um, there's an interesting point that I would love to hear more discussion from statisticians about is that the while we've been very heavily dependent and almost uh, you know, d d insisting correctly uh, for the, uh, the need for uh, experimentation and getting information about the effectiveness and safety of vaccines and therapies, we've been very um, quiet about the need for experimentation for other mitigation measures that are maybe more socially uh, oriented, uh, including things like school closures, uh, mask wearing, quarantine rules. Uh, and you can make a list perhaps longer than I have, many of which are actually amenable to um, experimentation if we had the mechanism set up and the thought done to do this. Um, there's a lot of there's been a lot of equipoise about those reflected by the ferociousness of the debates as to whether the answer is yes or no to various mitigation measures or the extent to them. And we just haven't tried to experiment enough, in my view. And I think we they're, they're, these experiments in these settings are not as easy, perhaps statistically as vaccine trials, but they are still doable. And I think we ought to give some thought to it. And and picking up on a point that Sarah made, we shouldn't forget all the lessons we've learned. There's been an, a remarkable over-reliance on ecological comparisons of infection and uh, data and hospitalization data, both often collected rather poorly and trying to address 
sort of causal questions as to why one country or one region is doing better than another. And an awful lot of statistical nonsense that we learned long ago we would never depend on uh, to test uh, therapies, for example. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then coming to uh, more to what Seb was talking about and forecasting models, which have been useful. Um, my own view is that the reproductive number, even in real time as a policy trigger, is insufficient. It's useful as a measure of the growth and what's happening in and now casting is useful as to what's happening. Uh, of course, delayed as, as several have pointed out from the timing of the infection events because you have to wait for symptoms to appear and the symptoms to be reported, often based on very incomplete uh, surveillance information where test, testing is often being driven by changes in infection rate. Um, and proxies of the reproductive rate are complex and, and poorly understood because the reproductive rate is itself a complex measure. It depends on very several different uh, underlying phenomena. Um, models are, are, I think, quite effective in retrospectively understanding evolving epidemiology. And um, Seth gave a nice example there of um, about the transmissibility of new variants and trying to work that, but they're not very effective in making predictions. And the public often want predictions. Maybe all of us as humans want to know where we're headed, where, what's going to happen next week. And models have been not very useful, in my view, in do that. And in focusing on those as the output of a model, I think has undermined the value of modeling in general. Um, of course, we know that models can be very effective in assessing potential mitigation strategies and ranking their potential impact. Next slide. And then finally, just to come to the last two where I feel much more on shaky ground is the sort of inter the interplay between science and policy. Um, I think there are an awful lot of things where we need work and um, statistician, we need to, we, we were very caught out, um, particularly in the US with um, stockpiles of protective equipment and uh, ability to um, produce rapid testing early on in the pandemic. And so we clearly need to do a better job of that. And we need to do that in times when things are not uh, so in such a critical stage. And I think statisticians should be involved in the design of how to prepare for outbreaks with uh, development of appropriate stockpiles. I think statisticians need to be more involved in the equitable distribution of resources. And there's been a tremendous amount of concern about the the great divide in terms of both uh, the impact of infections in terms of morbidity across different segments of society. And we were kind of caught flat-footed about to how to address that with equitable distribution of, of mitigation strategies. I think we need to know much more about digital contact tracing because human contact tracing um, turned out to be very, really overwhelming and was quickly um, lost as one of the, of course, primary epidemiological tools in, in stopping uh, infectious outbreaks. Testing, testing uh, is important. I think statisticians need to be very involved in the specifications of scientific technology that's being used to measure and uh, assess things. And there's lots of opportunities there. And I want to come back to the fact that most statisticians tend to be involved in the sort of what I would call research agencies. In other words, researching these questions from an academic or a statistical point of view. But there's a great need for statisticians to become involved in mission agencies, how actual uh, government and uh, other local jurisdictions implement research ideas into the field. And I think statisticians uh, are very helpfully involved in that uh, elsewhere. And of course, the, the last question that was posed to us is to sort of address the, the role and the collaboration with other international agencies. I think that was quite effective with the genomic sequencing, but perhaps less effective elsewhere. Uh, and last slide. And then the sort of the public understanding of science, and I'm now I'm even a more shaky ground, but I know there are many statisticians in the RSS that are very good at uh, this. 
I, I do want to point out that in my experience with HIV early on, that trust and education required long and concerted and consistent effort. It's not something unlike the scientific technology that you can maybe implement very quickly and launch a survey very quickly. You can't launch trust in a week and quickly. And so it needs a nurturing uh, in times when there, we are not in crisis so that it can be used effectively when um, when there are critical situations. And I think the, the UK has been well served by the Science Media Set Center, which is very effective. But I think they would be the first to agree that they have insufficient reach in terms of the way the public uh, consumes scientific information. And I think there's some real opportunity there to rethink or to to expand uh, those kind of services more broadly. And I'll I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Nick. We, we are running a, a little bit late, quite late, actually. So um, I, I would want, obviously, to, to have the panel discussion. So I invite all the speakers or the four speakers to put their camera on and we'll start with some questions uh, from, from the organizers, in fact. So uh, Sylvia, uh, John and myself. Uh, uh, go ahead if you have a, a question. I, I think I might have to reduce this um, this session, but um, go ahead. Thank you, Otherwise, Diane. Thank you to to all the speakers. It's there's so much to discuss. It it's very interesting. Um, maybe you know one thing which came through is uh, which Sarah started is what is good enough you know, and, and the fact of having to do very much agile uh, decision making. I, I was wondering, how could you make this transparent? Uh, because it's not, you know, who is going to judge what's good enough? And obviously, it depends on the objective. And it seems that what's good enough needs to be able to be challenged uh, uh, externally uh, in some way. And so there's an added difficulty about you know, how, what's the consensus are good enough, how you communicate that and how you make that transparent at all. I wondered if anybody wanted to comment on that. Can I just add in before, because I think it, my question would go very nicely with Sylvia, was how do you change good enough over time? Because I think as, as uh, many of you have pointed out that, you know, the models at the beginning were quite different to the models at the end. And I think we would all agree that good enough models at the end would be very different from the good enough models at the beginning. So that can be confusing for people too. So I would be really interested in not only, I think Silver's question is excellent about what, how do we choose what's good enough, but also how do we, how do we communicate to people as what we think or what, you know, what we would expect to be good enough changes as we go through. So who wants to take that question? Well, I mean, I, I can offer some reflections. I mean, I think, um, at least in my head, Sylvia, my 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 question is always, would it, if it was wrong by this much, would it change what you do? And you know, fundamentally, at least my reading of next paper on test negative case control designs, and Nick will probably tell me I'm wrong, is that you know the bias is of an order of you know five to ten percent. And fundamentally, that wasn't going to change the decision about vaccination policy. 40% maybe, 5 to 10% not. And so at least, it, and, and, and I agree with you about being transparent. You know, Seb made some really good points about transparency and, you know, being very open. But I think at least in my head, it's always, would it make a qualitative difference to action? And if it wouldn't, you know, and we all do our best all the time, then you say, you know, this is what I've done. You know, on this basis, I believe that the bias is likely to be the order of this. And therefore, this is a good enough estimate. But that's my personal opinion. Any other? Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah I, would just, I would just add to that, that I think, some, I think it was Sarah herself said that, you know, experience helps a lot. <laughs> in this if you've gone through pandemics before you sort of do get a sense of what what was good enough um, in the past so i think trying to draw on that and, and get a uh, in that into our education of, of new of new statisticians is important 
Um, and I, I come back to experimentation. I, I think sometimes we don't quite know what is good enough. We don't really know if an impl- a right. mitigation strategy will really make an impact. We, we think it might. And our tendency has been to idiosyncratically say, well, if we think it might, let's just uh, mandate it for everybody because it might, you know, what's wrong with it might make a difference and it won't hurt anyone. But that actually, I don't think, was very effective in getting the public's trust. And I think learning what is good enough by experimentation is uh, is quite useful um, because often our research about what might be good enough and what might happen if there are differences are based in the laboratory setting in the broad sense of the word and not in the field. And often things that look good enough in on paper actually when they impact the real world are not good enough or so I think it, we ought to experiment far more when we don't know what's good enough. Um, if I can add to that, I would, yeah. I would, I would, agree, I would agree that we often don't know, and I think that's the issue with what you, Sarah, suggested is that it's fine if it wouldn't make a, it wouldn't change the decision. But at the time at which the analysis is made, I think we often don't know. We we know. We're doing things that involve biases, and we don't necessarily know the, the scale of that bias at this moment in time. We'll know later with hindsight. And I think, um, to me, it really is what I tried to say in my talk, which is that it's it's driven by availability and what is possible in a short amount of time. Usually, a response is needed rapidly, and we all do our best, but I don't think there is an objective standard that we can then apply for whether that best is, is good enough. And I think... Um, in answer to your question, John, and kind of what how things have changed over time, um, I think another thing that I tried to bring out is that a lot of the tasks that were necessary during the pandemic were necessary repeatedly. You know, new, a new variant emerges, a bunch of analysis comes up. Next time a new variant emerges, all that all the analysis is available, and then we can draw on that and we can do that and improve it, or we've improved it maybe in the meantime. Um, those are my thoughts on that. But, but Seb, I come back to the point I made again in the chat. I think that's where the ensemble, you know, modelling that really spy um, really to me, you know, encapsulated is also so valuable, you know, in terms of, you know, good enough if actually all of the models are moving in the same direction with roughly the same estimates, then whatever the biases are, you know, I think that gives you confidence. And I, it's this thing again about diversity. There not being one true way that we all have to do it this way. Um, I, th- I think that's another way to triangulate good enough. I think it also depends on on, on, on who it's for and the context of that relationship um, and, and the, d- the degree to which um, you can explore the caveats and contextualise them. Um, you know, the importance of the that we've talked about, about the statistician being st- sort of standing shoulder to shoulder with other professionals as part of that discourse, enables something which perhaps isn't good enough to be received, um, you know, a- as it is uh, with, with, with the caveats and the analytical literacy of, 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 of who we're having a conversation with, I, I think I, I certainly would, would adapt my approach depending on those characteristics as well and I, I agree with 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 what others others have said um thank you there are interesting questions in the chat but hopefully we'll be able to pick them up uh in the in the later session and anyone is going to pick up john's uh question about you know what is good enough actually depends on on the face uh, or, or, or the epidemic or do we have a different way of judging what is good enough earlier rather than later? I mean, uh, to my mind, Danny, I think Seb addressed that quite a lot in that I think if you think about our, our response to alpha, yeah, yeah. we, we yeah. were very, we were a dollar, le- what is it, a dollar late and a day short, a day late and a dollar short, you, you know, in, in many, many, many ways. Um, but I think by the time Delta arrived, and certainly you think of the speed at which, you know, we had estimates of the impact of Omicron on, you know, serial interval, hospitalisation, vaccine effectiveness. Uh, I mean, I think 
it, it, it's more that that kind of learning experience, as, mm. as Nick said. Um, if, if I could uh, add uh, to, to Barton's point of Seb about the common tools and the common, you know, uh, the, the many statistical tasks, do, do, you, do you feel that, um, you know, how could best sharing of these common tasks be done in, uh, you know, in, in a country or, you know, within the community so that, so that you know, we equipped quicker at, at the beginning of any new phenomenon? I mean, I, I would be honest, at least from my perspective, the answer is yes. But, you know, I've been privileged to see, you know, some of SPIM and a lot of variant technical group where a lot of statisticians from a very wide range of disciplines contribute an enormous amount on a regular basis. I mean, I don't know, Seb, you may have a, have a different view. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, yeah, I disagree. I think that there's been great sharing of kind of insights and results and maybe methods, but in terms of actual tools or kind of steps of analysis, I think there's still been a lot of duplication and multiple groups doing ultimately the same thing due to the lack of sharing. And um, I mean, Thomas House, I think, raised an excellent point in the chat, which is, um, that we don't really have good incentives in academia to to collaborate on these things and um, and and or making reproducible tools or analysis scripts for this. And I don't really think that's been. I think that the research community has been kind of open spirited and there's been plenty of exchange, but in terms of kind of practical um, helping each other and actual collaboration, I think there's been a lot less of. And I would have liked to see a lot more. Do you think about it because uh, it's because the driving force is not so much the response and the emergency, but still down there, uh, there, there is a there is a an academic, uh, you know, yeah, pride and a competition, which probably, have, um, yeah, I mean the, the the research competition basically, um, yeah. In an emergency, I don't think. Well, it's. A, I think it's not just a competition. It's also keeping people in a job, right? I mean, if you're a junior researcher, and a lot of the work has been done by junior researchers, um, if you want to stay in your job, you shouldn't really be like making code that others can use. You should be writing papers that are published in high impact journals because that's what the next hiring committee is going to base their their decision on. Um, so so I, th I think more of that as the incentives rather than, and the competition, of course, is also true, especially again between. Um, junior researchers, but I, I mean, I don't know what's on the yeah. forefront of people's mind in psychological terms, but I think the, these are the underlying issues. Now, I was wondering whether agency or so, some some bodies can help, you know, uh, in terms of preparedness for, for, for the future in this sharing and, and, and seeing, you know, all the, you know, the tools which have been developed, which could be repurposed, which would be available, and whether this would be, uh, you know, preparedness steps in some way. Oh, if I can comment on that to Cynthia, uh, the same happened in the H1N1 pandemic and that there was, a, you know, the creation of repository, but when, when this one started, the, the story was pretty different. So every pandemic has got its own characteristics, you can be prepared, but uh, Anyway, I would uh, I would like to stop at this point because uh, we, we we need to get on with the two minute contribution and and pick up any any other questions you might have together with the really interesting comments that be made on the chat uh, for for the latest session uh, from the audience. Okay, um, or questions from the audience. So I would uh, I would then. Um, um, invite you to, 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 to close the video, please. And then we can start with the two minute, minute converse, um, presentation. Um, um, I, I'm going to time this, okay? So please uh, be really, uh, you know, don't go over time. And I'm going to, to appear again a few, min a few seconds before the, the two minutes to stop people. Okay, so the first one I think is a pre-recorded um, intervention from Roger Pilk. Um, 
Can we can we load yes. it, please? I'm going to show you now. Hello, I'm Roger Pelkey Jr. coming to you from Boulder, Colorado, and I'm going to give you a real quick talk on science and policy and politics. Thanks for the opportunity. So what is advice anyway? Um, advice is guidance regarding a decision or a course of conduct. Uh, by definition, advice is in the context of someone um, choosing among uh, different courses of action. Now, within advice, there's different types of advice. Science advice is the most narrow. It can be uh, focused on disciplinary or interdisciplinary expertise. Expert advice is broader. Uh, it can include practitioners. It can include multidisciplinary expertise. Uh, it's, it's much more grounded in skill uh, or knowledge uh, than just science advice, which is based in knowledge. Political advice, which is really important in decision-making context, has to do with bargaining, negotiation, and compromise, uh, the essence of democratic politics. All of these, however, are policy advice. Um, one thing we found in our studies of different uh, responses to the pandemic worldwide uh, has been a lack of clarity on what type of advice is exactly being provided in specific contexts. Now, I wrote a book, uh, I won't be able to go into it in too much detail, that tried to outline roles and responsibilities for providing uh, scientific advice in policy settings. Um, in the book, there are four categories plus one bonus category. I'll just quickly go through those. Uh, first is the pure scientist. We can debate whether the pure scientist actually exists, uh, but the defining characteristic is no, no desire or interest to be connected to policy. Uh, in practice, uh, we find this is a very hard distinction to make because uh, people often advocate that they are just pure scientists, but they are, uh, in fact, trying to put their thumb on the scale of decision making. The science arbiter, we do this quite well. The science arbiter is characterized by a back and forth relationship with policymakers, where the policymaker will ask a question that can be answered with the tools of science. Uh, experts uh, or scientists will try to answer that, and uh, maybe the questions get refined. We do this very well, generally, in science advisory bodies around the world. The issue advocate, the defining characteristic of the issue advocate is a desire to try to reduce the scope of choice of policymakers, usually down to one preferred option. Uh, so people advocating for lockdowns or no lockdowns, those are advocates. Now, at the opposite end of the spectrum, spectrum from the issue advocate is the honest broker. The, the, the goal of the honest broker is to expand or clarify the scope of options to empower decision makers to make choices. So think of the honest broker like a travel website. Um, it tells you where you might go, how much you might pay, um, but it doesn't tell you where you have to go. Um, here's some examples of advisory mechanisms from out there in the real world. Uh, science advice is the SAGO committee uh, researching COVID-19 origins of the WHO. Um, the UN 1540 com uh, committee uh, has broad expertise trying to evaluate the implementation of UN uh, nuclear non-proliferation agreements. Uh, the UK Independent Sage uh, recently wrote in PNAS that they're an issue advocate. Uh, they're pushing for specific political outcomes uh, in the policy process. Um, a JRC, a European Union Committee, that seeks alternatives to animal testing, they're an honest broker. They're trying to expand options. And the various regulatory committees that we see that give a thumbs up or thumbs down on vaccine approval, uh, those are issue advocates as well. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, here's how you can reach me. And uh, good luck in your, uh, in your work. Bye-bye. So that, that was an interesting definition, a series of interesting definitions. Please, uh, Sylvia. Good afternoon. So as statistician and data scientist, we must add our voice to clarify the distinction between scientific evidence and its consequences. And we need to help policymakers understand the way in which current and often time limited evidence can inform their actions. Statistical expertise has a unique place in the sequence of events which starts with scientific findings and ends with a specific policy implementation. Along this process, advising on the analysis and interpretation of data which supports scientific conclusion, identify the need for new data to fill knowledge gap, helping in designing data collection, highlighting sources of uncertainty, quantifying their impact, and assisting in evidence synthesis for squarely in the statistician's corner. And many of the issues that confronted the UK 
have benefited from including a statistical perspective right from the start, and we've heard from previous speakers some of the main root of the statistical input. But there were also missed opportunities. For example, evaluating the performance of the test entry system for stopping transmission would have benefited from the embedding of agile data linkage right from the start and regular reporting of epidemiologically interpretable quantity. A final separate point I would like to make relate to question five about the international um, data. I was part of an interdisciplinary expert group the International Best Practice Advisory Group, which provided weekly input and challenge to analysis carried out by the International Joint Comparator Unit, a unit established specifically in April 20 by Cabinet Office to learn from international responses to the COVID pandemic. Using quantitative data, sometimes pretty sparse, that were available, as well as information from the diplomatic network of scientific attaché, ICJU produced weekly analysis on a whole range of issues, international trends, NPI strategies, um, how scientific See, advice yeah, was organized, yeah. travel rules, and so on, and which were refined by the uh, IBPAC expert group before being presented to cabinet. And we were told that these weekly international analyses were considered as key inputs into UK decision making over the course of the pandemic, particularly when the pandemic was hitting the UK after our comparators. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just on time. Um, the next one is uh, Rob Harrison from the Cabinet Office. Please. Hi there. Uh, we cannot hear you. You're muted. I beg your pardon. Um, I'm okay. going to talk before, about... Before you start, can I invite everyone to cl to close their video, please? Um, so we only see... Thank you. Please. Thank you. So uh, from April 20 to October 20, I was involved in uh, ICJU, which Sylvia just mentioned. But I'm going to talk about my, my role after October 2020 as the head of analysis in the COVID-19 task force in the Cabinet Office and the personal insights that I gained on, on, on um, what had impact. Um, the first was there was always a high level of uncertainty and a very wide range of views about the best course of action. And it was essential to provide decision makers with a single shared picture of the available evidence as a common starting point for those discussions. Um, so conversations should be in two parts, one where you're debating what the, what the evidence can tell you, and the second, what to do about it. Um, a persistent challenge was how to communicate complexity and uncertainty in ways that were accurate, um, but quickly and clearly in, um, accessible to a lay audience. Um, and I think that there are a couple of really good examples that I might mention. One was the, 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 COVID the ONS COVID infection survey, which provided a world-class, high-frequency, large-scale time series to track the trajectory of the, the pandemic, but whose headline results could be printed on, presented to decision makers on a, uh, in, in a single visualization. Um, the second good example is pinned to Graham Medley's Twitter feed, I find, which is um, an, an example of how um, scenarios from multiple modeling groups can be layered to show the shape of the, flaws, the plausible future space and the distribution of probabilities within it in a way that was much more helpful to policymakers than fixating on one or two scenarios, usually the more dramatic ones. Um, and finally, I'd just like to talk about people. So we were very fortunate to have a strong cadre of professional statisticians, but being able to draw on um, professionals from the academic community and beyond um, was essential to the to the government's response. And the two enablers of this, I think, were transparency and trust. Um, on transparency, it was essential that the statistical reports from ONS, scientific papers from SAGE and the uh, were all published. But I'd like to make a special mention of the uh, the PHE and later AXA public dashboard which made a huge range of government data available in machine readable format for others to use, which really improved the not only the quality of analysis within government, um, but also the quality of the public debate. 
And finally, I think that we had most impact when the policy was designed to be data driven. So a really good example of this was the Spring 21 roadmap, which was um, uh, the, the, the gap between steps was designed to allow a minimum of three weeks of data plus time for decision making and implementation. So we can uh, design policy in a way which makes it um, uh, easy for statisticians to inform it. Thank you very much. I would agree with that totally. Thank you. OK, the next uh, is. Pardon my present um, pronunciation of your of your name, Aditya Cuenca. Yes, thank you. Please I'm, an I'm going to time you. I'm an economist, so I'll give an eco economist perspective on the um, role of evidence and policy making during the COVID pandemic. There was considerable interest in using the data on infection and mortality, as well as indicators such as intensity of non-pharmaceutical interventions to understand the impact of COVID on the economy and society for policy making. However, it was often it was not well appreciated that the variables and indicators are jointly determined, so that drawing any inference of causality can be problematic. To give an example, <clears throat> uh, regressing economic outcomes on severity of the policy lockdowns to understand the health versus wealth trade-off was of interest to policymakers. However, infections, economic outcomes, and policy response are determined jointly, and none of these are exogenous in a statistical sense. Thus, looking at the effect of severity of a lockdown on economic or infection uh, indicators can be misleading. To give another example, uh, understanding the effect of school closures, openings on infections was very important. But these were all shut and open at the same time in the background of other interventions. So there is no natural variation to infer what is the causal effect of a school opening or a shutdown. Now, as economists, we use a variety of econometric techniques to make these causal inferences to study the effect of policies on different variables where human beings are involved. Uh, these include natural experiments, RCTs, which were mentioned earlier, regression, discontinuity analysis, definitive methods, instrumental variables, etc. I mentioned these because I think these should be part of a toolkit for generating evidence-based policy making. To, to, totally agree. We did our best, I have to say, because I was part of, of this response to, to alert uh, to the danger and to use as much as possible those, uh, those, those tools. But in an emergency where everything needs to be done, it, you know, within 24 hours, it, it's, it's not always, but I totally agree. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you. Um, we, we go on to Jen Person, please. Thank you. Thank you. In the 2020 rapid response to remote learning, the Department for Education told schools that the number of devices available, that is to say laptops, routers and hardware, would only be confirmed at the time of ordering based on stock availability. Schools were reportedly able to only claim 20% of what they expected. And I think it's important we look at what assumptions and data were used in calculations. I suggest there are three reasons to understand this from our perspective at Defend Digital Me, an NGO interested in children's digital rights and data in the education sector. Not only to understand how the devices were allocated, but the methodology and process for doing so. A, to address future responses for readiness in future pandemics or infrastructure failure noting that the same calculation model was repeated in 2021-22 after 2020, and B, to understand everyday current provision in the digital divide and to understand C, the Departments for Education's data quality and prioritisation, i.e. is it good enough to do again? 
There are um, two existing assumptions that were made that we thought important to address that we identified through freedom of information request in 2021 because the Department for Education's Get Help with Technology program has published data on their allocations, but not the assumptions built into it. We don't have time for the full detail here, but to sum up, the uh, department used assumptions that private device need would be met by some extent of existing uh, laptops held. The uh, they assumed that uh, the freedom, uh, the free school meals allocation did not give an accurate picture of device requirements, and that influenced the distribution assumptions. Assumption was also made that the first devices sent to schools would go to teachers and remove devices equivalent to that percentage of teachers in an average school from the average number of devices that they already held. So there were closed proprietary sets of data used in those calculations, two of which were TeacherTap, a closed survey tool, and the second BISA and ICT. To wrap up, I would say there are three gaps that could be interesting for future research. One, that proxy uh, for poverty is not uh, adequate to use free school uh, meals for this calculation. Uh, they did not know, factor in that known free school meals year on year growth rate pre 2018 was known prior to being uh, using calculated retrospective data. And uh, two unknown factors that could be worthy of further research the uh, areas of no recourse to public funds and whether free school meal eligibility ethnicity uh, meant that allocation was equitable or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Very important points. Ian McKendrick, please. Thank you for the chance to speak today. For 16 years, Scottish Government has funded EPIC, a centre providing evidence-based advice to policymakers on epizootic animal disease outbreaks. This was set up in response to the 2001 foot and mouth disease outbreak. I am currently a director with a specific responsibility for data-driven activities. EPIC is a virtual centre with staff from six partner universities and institutes, funding banked by time for statisticians, mathematical modellers, data managers, epidemiologists, social scientists, economists, and science policy interface brokers. All of these roles are very important. Listening to the four speakers, I'm relieved that we have been trying to address most of the points that they've raised. The funding, the long-term funding and existence of EPIC is critical in providing certain key positive outcomes. Staff being in post with the right balance of relevant skills trusted working relationships within the group and with key policy staff, good understanding of the needs of the policy customer in hypothetical but likely synapse situations. For example, we've been able to participate in some of the national emergency exercises. Access to key data sets negotiated in advance, managed in a GDPR compliant fashion and actively curated for ongoing use. Having multiple analytical pipelines and model code repos already in advance for use at short notice in an emergency. And this isn't just to automate things, it just it also is to leave space for critical and creative thinking on the fly. Uh, a trend for us to move into surveillance activities has obvious over the years. Uh, a realistic understanding of how hard all of this is. These positives don't happen spontaneously. They need long-term funding and careful management. Thank you. You even finished be before the time. Maybe this EPIC consortium is something that we should look at. Thank you very much. Um, Thomas House. Two minutes, Thomas. Well, also thanks, Danny. Um, I think there are a lot of things that, that uh, one could say about the pandemic, but one thing I think is quite important is the need for diversity in um, the inputs. But I think that needs to be the right kind that I think somehow our media environment makes it much easier for people with a simple and quite extreme measure on something um, to be made very prominent. People who think there are easy answers or a particular intervention is a, is a really terrible thing we should never consider or that that intervention is a panacea. Um, I don't know exactly what the solution to that is, but I, I certainly felt that um, a lot of the real scientific debate was happening in a way that would have been great for the public to be more involved in. Things like how rapid testing was or wasn't used, general test and trace was used, which kind of non-pharmaceutical interventions represented the right balance. 
and a lot of the debate that was served um, in the media tended to to focus on um, people who could who could say things in a kind of quick uh, soundbite, which I'm probably going to uh, fail to do um, now. So I, I think it it would be nice if we could maybe as as professionals try to encourage the debate to be more you know the, the public to be more involved and better informed uh, in these things and and I think actually um you know that it's been a common refrain that people like uh, David Spiegelhalter who just decided he was going to learn about the death data and and um challenge people who both over and understated that did get in a lot of uh, hot hot water with with those those people who um have maybe slightly stronger opinions than the evidence uh, was there. And just the very final point, we are in the middle of a, a quite serious outbreak of monkeypox, um, which could have been much more lethal. And I think, um, although some lessons have, have, have been learned, I, I, I think just the numbers that that's got to this very severe disease with quite distinctive symptoms suggests that at some level, our systems are not doing what we might hope um, they might have been able to do. And it's probably too early to, to diagnose that. And I certainly think no one no individual should be singled out there, but but it, it I think this is this this ongoing outbreak highlights the need for this kind of reflective discussion that we're having. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, uh, Harrison Schramm, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for your kind invitation to speak here today. Uh, the arc of my career has put me at the crossroads of statistics and public policy in the United States. When I consider the interaction between evidence-based decisions, which is our focus as statisticians, and the demands placed on policymakers, th there is frequently a divide. Uh, the divide exists partially due to academic backgrounds, but more importantly, because uh, it's my opinion that the personality traits that make one successful in policy uh, are generally disjoint from those that make one successful in the hard sciences. Uh, most of us are probably not interested in campaigning for public office, and most policymakers that I know are not interested in writing code. Um, therefore, it's my opinion that we as statisticians are the ones who have to cross this aisle and close this divide because we're the ones who can. Uh, to do this, we need to be continuously moving our results, and particularly the presentation of those results, in a direction of balancing our technical merit with practical accessibility to policymakers. Too frequently, as a, as a profession, we jump to why you should believe me or why you should believe this result and neglect to answer the question that's of critical importance to the policymaker, which is why I, the policymaker, should believe that you understand my problems. Thus, we should focus on building rapport with policymakers when available. Uh, this involves uh, learning the nuances of their language, which are different than the nuances of ours, um, and also learning their dress code. Um, we should listen as much as we speak and convince them uh, that we do under that we can and do understand their problems. Uh, without trust from the decision makers we support, uh, we find our technical we will find our technical effort is largely wasted. Um, thank you, and with that, I yield the balance of my time. Again, you finished before the time. Thank you. Um, okay, the next speaker is. Hi, I'm trying to uh, to pronounce your name. Um, Ola, Ola Re Baju, yes, Eniade. Please correct me. Oh, I think he's been having internet problems, so I think we need to skip. Okay, um, we we go to Andrea Renman, please. Hi, I'm giving my perspective as the chair of the International Development Section. So there were a couple of key moments where global data fed into the management of UK border policies. Firstly, the early ascertainment of risk where risk was underestimated from Europe. In this phase, the Home Affairs Committee in August 2020 identified a lack of transparency over which data or evidence informed the decision on border management in March of that year. Secondly, the traffic light system from May 21, transparent data was published by the Joint Biosecurity Centre and sourced from the WHO as well as a non-profit um, Global Change Data Lab based in Oxford, who compiled data from global, uh, government departments worldwide. Initial coordination of global data sources lacked a clear leader. Was it ONS, SAGE scientists, the Home Office, Department of Health or WHO? 
Evidence submitted to the Home Office Preparedness for COVID-19 in July 21 stated that data sharing between governments was identified as necessary for effective border management and that access to and quality of global data remain a big question mark. A question remains as to what has changed in the year since. The United Nations Economic Commission for Africa commissioned an assessment of the impact of the pandemic on National Statistics Office operations in late 20 and identified they were overwhelmed by requests for data and statistical services. These data were feeding into the compiled data sources informing UK policy. Questions remain over how much support and guidance are available to support global data collection and whether ODA budget cuts indirectly affected data gathering. In terms of lessons we can learn, transparency is key, government investment in tactical sharing of evidence or insight is warranted where data might not always be available, and cuts to international development budgets can impact on data and evidence availability. Again, you finished before the two minutes. Thank thank you, Andrea. Thank you very much. Well well made. Okay, we, we finish with uh, John Aston, one of my, uh, and the organizers. Please, Great. John. Thanks. Thanks, Danny. And I mean, I just want to thank everybody for uh, their contributions. I think it's been a, a really great uh, session. Uh, so, I mean, for me, I think we've we've been really lucky. We've seen that there's been some statisticians who've had, you know, really high profile ability to work between uh, sort of the, the technical areas and uh, the policy implications. And I think the, the roles that many people have played, including many of the people who are uh, who we've heard from today, and indeed many others who we haven't heard from, has been you know has been has really shown the value that statistics can play in these kind of uh, in these kind of events. I think we really need to be very clear, and I think a number of speakers have mentioned it that we want to be uh, not policy advocates, but really uh, uh, science arbiters. We we as statisticians have real abilities to understand how bias comes into um, our thinking, and I think being able to, to disaggregate that from the bias that we see um, in when we try to uh, advocate for position, uh, a position uh, is something that we as statisticians can be very aware of and uh, be very good at uh, restricting ourselves to. I want to really highlight the role of statisticians in government. We've, we've, uh, we've seen uh, the amazing work that's been done by ONS, but there's actually statisticians in many, many government departments who've worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make sure that the data that's being used in policy decisions. And I think we should be really grateful to a number of statisticians right across government uh, who, with you know very little uh, uh, profile, have uh, really tried to make sure that good data is being used, notwithstanding the fact that there was, you know, at times the data was very difficult to get hold of, particularly early in the pandemic. But I think we've also should be clear that you know some of the government data that has come out uh, of the pandemic has been really useful, but it's been useful partly because it can be complemented by other data that's not government data. And I think the combination, uh, as Sarah said, between the React data and the the COVID infection survey is is, an, is a really good example of where bringing lots of different data together um, has really made huge differences to understanding. Um, and that's only been possible because of the response of the community. I think uh, while you know absolutely we should learn lessons, we should also be very clear that we have done huge amounts of good work. And that's only because we, as a, as, uh, as a, a group of people, have really you know come together to really try to help out in the pandemic. And I think we should be really really proud of the work that we've done. Thank you a lot. Uh, now we've got a limited time for the Q and A. Uh, but um, of course, as I said at the very beginning, all the questions and all the considerations and comments that have been um, um, put in the chat will be will be, will be trans transcribed, so they will not be lost. But I would invite now the audience to 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 ask questions. Maybe some of the people that made really interesting interesting uh, uh, questions and, and considerations in the chat, please. Uh, we have. Um, Let's say no more than 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes to do that. And then I'll wrap it up very quickly at the end, please. Anyone wants to, to ask I'm, a question? I'm what? not sure that people can unmute themselves. But they can, um, but they can, uh, can make a sign okay. if they want to ask a question. So. I'll so put in the uh, chat. please uh, r right, erase your hands and then, and then uh, the, the relevant person will unmute you. These are the beauties of the virtual meeting, I'm afraid.
You can't see our hands. Okay, Nigel. Uh, Nigel, please. Uh, I think Nigel had put lots of comments throughout, so yes. I think. So Nigel, Jacqueline, can can he be a muting, <laughs> please? Also, Peter Diggle had made quite a lot of comments. Maybe it could also be a mute. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, please okay. put your video on, please, Nigel. It won't come on, so I'll just keep talking. Okay. Um, oh, here you are. Oh, you're there. Yeah. Can see you. Okay, it's working now. Good, cool. Um, I'm a statistician and a market researcher, and I've worked with a number of campaign groups who think that the measures taken did more harm than good. Um, the complaints that we've had from MPs in Parliament were that when they were presented with the original recommendations back in March, there was too little time, three hours to absorb lots of complicated information and some of the normal democratic processes were, were thrown to one side. Um, then what we had were people within cabinet saying, I privately oppose it, but I have to publicly support it. Um, but I think that's pretty standard for, for government and was the same with the Iraq war. Um, the biggest complaint has been a lack of alternative viewpoints different interpretations were underlying health conditions important and susceptibility important. And that's come from several MPs and peers, and I think has been in some of their recommendations moving forwards. And then the best one was from the Chancellor, which was that there was a mistake on page 71 of the modelling report. So I think it's been a crisis of decision making. It's not a crisis of evidence because Anybody who takes decisions has to be used to taking decisions with inadequate evidence. Thank you very much. Is anyone who wants to, is this a comment or is it a question, Nigel? I think it's a comment. Okay. Okay. Thomas, do you have an answer? You're muted, Thomas. Well, well, I don't have an answer because I think it's a difficult question. But, but I mean, Nigel, I think your point is one that has been raised by a lot of influential journalists and and um, MPs and so on, and and deserves, I think, a, it was one of the things I think deserved a proper discussion. And I think it was unfortunate that a lot of the criticism of what was a legitimate policy position, which is how does the do the harms trade off, which I think I just don't know. Um, this falls in the category of not a scientific question, got wrapped up with questions like how plausible is a very large second wave. And really, there was a point where I think it was Tom Whipple at the time said we were having discussions about reality when we should have been having discussions about policy. And the reality was the second wave was coming. And I don't think the scientific evidence for that, that second wave, once we, you know, it was to do with low serology, low evidence for extreme genetic heterogeneity and so on. I think I think a second wave of, of greater than or, uh, you know, greater than or at least equal severity to the first was was very predictable. But then there's a separate question as, as to what the right, you know, right in inverted commas response to that is. And I think this is the sort of thing would have been helpful to to split off because I think there's an infinite number of completely valid opinions on whether given that there's going to be this growth in infection, we should have certain legal restrictions on certain things or not. So, for example, France kept schools open longer than the UK, and there's very strong arguments that that should have been a bigger policy uh, objective than, than reopening pubs, for example, uh, given the harms of school closures. But that's separate. That, that has to be, I think, hived off from the fact we really were very certain that there was going to be a second wave and subsequent waves. I, I just think that the the kind of scepticism that was expressed about, about what were really relatively minor features of the models um, I think was not really terribly appropriate or helpful, but I, I'm obviously open to other. I think this is a good thing to discuss because a lot of people are thinking and saying it. Okay. Um, I think Peter's next, isn't he? Yes, Peter's next. Peter? We can't hear you, Peter. We can't hear you.
Can, can I just respond quickly while we're waiting? Yes, um, please. I think essentially what happened was... Okay, so I'd like to... Wisdom was I'd like to leave... Sorry, what's going, what's going on? Sorry, Am I speaking or not? Peter, yeah. yes. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to link two comments that I originally made independently. One is I think there's, as a community, we need to get across the message that data are only a, the raw material of information. Okay. And, and there's been too much effort, and certainly in the lay press, and I suspect in decision making quarters on raw numbers. And some of the presenters gave us very good examples of why that's not always a good idea. And then the other thing, which I think is is related, in fact, is is the point I made about the contrast between uh, my experience of working with neglected tropical disease communities, where important agencies like the WHO are willing to debate based on evidence as to what threshold of prevalence of a particular disease would merit a particular intervention. And I've, I've detected a complete absence of that sort of debate at high levels in, in the UK. And I think it would be helpful if, if uh, there could be more willingness of people to engage in what objective measures might be justified by particular evidence linked, of course, to, as various people have said, the reliability, robustness of that evidence as measured by predictive probabilities. Is there a comment? There is a comment, isn't it? You spent someone to reply to that, Peter? Not particularly, no. I'm always interested in other people's views, but it, as you say, it was not a specific question. No. Uh, uh, Nigel, did you, you were in the middle of saying something. I didn't want to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, Essentially, my point was that back in March 2020, all conventional medical wisdom was overturned in, in that the idea of staying at home to avoid being infected by a disease which had a low severity is bonkers. Oh, that's an interesting interpretation. Um, I'm sure lots of people may, may have an opinion on that. Um, does anyone yeah. want to express, uh, 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 make a comment on this? Without be becoming political, obviously. Yeah, so my wife's just got back. She trained as a doctor. So um, I realise that there probably are some people in the room who also have medical training. But um, uh, it, it was an exceptional series of interventions and, and that's why it's a very important set of decisions that were taken and that's why this inquiry matters. Okay. And any other question or any other consideration on this? I, I was just going to comment, Danny, that I don't think in March 2020 that we understood the case fatality rate very well. Um, in my experience with coronaviruses was with SARS, which was our only really comparison at that point, which ran a 10% case fatality rate, which would have been, of course, catastrophic uh, under any circumstance, any policy had um, SARS-CoV-2 had that case fatality rate. It's only much later that we learned, we started to learn what the case fatality rate was. So I think it's uh, inappropriate to characterize it as being known as being not very consequential affection in March 2020. It is. I mean, I don't think the, the information was there. There was a nope. need, there was a need to, to do something. Uh, and it, as uh, the little evidence that was available at that point actually was pointing out the situation which could have been really catastrophic. So in retrospect, you might comment, Nigel, in the way that you commented, but as we were there and we were living the situation, with the information available, I'm not quite sure whether 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 I, I would agree with your statement. Um, yeah. Okay. So, as Paul is making an interesting an, an interesting comment in the, in the chat. Um, anyone else 
anyone else for any any questions? Any other question from the audience? I know that virtually, if this had been in, in person, it would have been much much more natural. And you know, there is nothing we can do about it. But is there anyone who wants to make a, a, a final a final comment? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Well, well, all of this has been just uh, touching the the, the 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 point of you know the the the, the iceberg, but uh, but there is an awful lot we could uh, we could discuss about. I mean, this is an infinite uh, discussion and could go on for uh, forever. So, but at this point, I need to stop. So uh, I. I'm just uh, sorry. I'm just uh, keeping an, an eye on the chat myself because there are lots of interesting things we could have uh, explored and discussed more. But time is up, and uh, and um, I think it's time to wrap up. Uh, in terms of uh, the presentation, in terms of the original questions that they were asked, I think there is a consensus on the fact that the statistical thinking is not just useful; is essential. If there is a there is also an agreement on the fact that perhaps we need to rethink a little bit the, the figure of the statistician um, and, uh, and, and the def or, or uh, valued perhaps even more the different types of, of statisticians that are around. But the, the new figure of statistician has to be probably someone who is, who is um, you know, open, um, adaptable, um, collaborative, interdisciplinary, uh, that, um, and uh, I think we should push the system to recognize that the contribution of, of this type of individuals and this type of professionals, not just uh, the publications and the academic uh, output, but that there is much more the statistician could be doing. Um, the other thing is, is next time, how do we train them? How do we train people to, to be more open to, to act uh, rapidly in a situation of emergency? Do they have the, the right, the right um, tools or the right um, you know, sort of background? And I wonder in this whether there is a role for the Royal Statistical Society to, to play, to um, maybe in terms of training the statisticians, but also training the policy makers because there is another point that came across you know whether the policy maker are able to to receive the, the the message from the statisticians who obviously they have to adapt to their communication their communication um, um, level now there, there, there are lots and lots of issues which we could uh, we could go on forever discussing but uh, um, I just um, I just want to to just finish with thanking everyone that uh, has participated in this in this session. Has been the most challenging one because it's been virtual. So probably the interaction has been a bit more of a difficult one. But um, I would like to uh, um, thank the organisers, with me, Sylvia and and John. Um, I would like to uh, thank the exceptional speakers, Sarah, Seb and my Nick. Uh, the, all the two minute speakers that raise lots of interesting points, which will make sure they'll be uh, recorded uh, in some way. And, and in the audience, the people actually joined and didn't maybe dare say very much. Um, then I would like to, to uh, um, thank very much the RSS staff for, for uh, making this happen, um, Teresa, um, Alfie uh, and Jonathan. So thank you very much for participating and three minutes behind, but I think we caught up very nicely. Thank you for your collaboration, uh, co contribution, sorry, and for your participation. And the next one will be on evaluation and it will be on the 12th of July. So bye for now and have a nice evening.